Hello, people of the Jordan, who know that there's no better place to be on a Thursday night. Am I right? Yeah. Hey, if, if we haven't met, my name is Spencer Osborne. Uh, I have the privilege of being able to pastor a high school ministry at the Fallbrook campus. It's called Volume. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, that's what I get to do, and that's something that I love to be able to do. But I also love getting to come and spend time with you guys on Thursdays. And so when Damien gave me that invite, I didn't even look at my calendar. I was like, yep, I'll be there. I'll make it happen. And just being able to sit with him and with his team and talk about this series that you guys have been in, uh, Vintage Jesus, which is so much more than just like really cool graphics, but just like the idea behind it and the message behind it, this vintage Jesus of turning our focus from the hands of Jesus to what can you do for me, what do you have for me to the face of Jesus, to the person of Jesus, to the relationship that we are invited into with Christ. And when I think about Lent, when I think about the season and, and the purpose of Lent, I think about a season of waiting. And I am not a patient person. It doesn't matter what it is that I am waiting for. Uh, I, I'm, never, I'm never very patient. If you want to see me go like zero to 60 in anger, make me have to drive through LA during, for, during rush hour, okay? That's like, that's a no for me, okay? Because I don't like waiting. And, and to be honest, none of us like waiting. None of us enjoy waiting. You know what the number one household appliance in, uh, in more households than there are TVs and refrigerators across the United States? It's the microwave. And you know why that is? It's because we like things quick, all right? Because you think, you have that thought in your mind where you're like, oh, I could go for a snack. And then your second thought isn't, hmm, I should get a bunch of ingredients together and see what's in the fridge and have something simmering on the stove for me to enjoy in an hour, like a loser, okay? You're thinking like, no, what is the quickest and most efficient way to get calories into my body through my mouth right now? And you go, and that's through the microwave. And that's why people are more willing to have microwaves than they are to have TVs or refrigerators because we are impatient. And so when we go through the season of Lent and that idea of waiting, it can be a little discouraging for a lot of us because you know what that season of waiting can feel like. And maybe you've experienced that in life. And it's more than just like, you know, for whatever reason, a minute on a microwave is the longest minute in the world. Uh, it's more than that. Maybe you've experienced a season of waiting for God's provision, where there has been a request that you have brought to him, where there has been a prayer. It's been a prayer for revival. It's been a prayer for healing. It's been a prayer for restoration. It's been a prayer for him to fix something or to give something. And you find yourself just in a season of waiting. For what? For provision. For something to be provided to you. Why? Because if you've grown up in the church, there was something that we learned very early on that God is a good father. He has something for us. He has something to give to us. And so when we are in need, it's kind of wired into us of like, well, maybe I should give that a shot. Maybe we go to him. Have you ever heard him referred to as provider? God is provider. He is creator first and foremost, but he is also sustainer and he is provider. And when you put your faith in Christ, what happens is God commissions himself to protect, provide, and care for you. But it won't always look the way that you want it to or expect it to. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, it says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory. In Christ Jesus. Notice it doesn't say, and my God will meet all your needs according to whatever you want, according to your riches and your glory. He says, according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. God always provides for his children, though it is, not, though it is often not the way that we would expect or want. And the challenge is for us to see his provision and his care 
through the truth of his word and not through the context and the lens of our preference and what we want. Because oftentimes when we ask for blessing or we ask for provision, we have an idea in our own minds of what that blessing and what that provision should look like. And so if it looks any different than that, if it looks different in any way from what we had in our minds of what would be appropriate, we become discouraged and we grumble about it. But in Isaiah 55, 9, we know that God is God and his ways are higher than our ways. It says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And yet in spite of this, he graciously gives us insight to what he is doing in the scriptures, in his word. John Piper once said, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, but you'll only ever be aware of three. Like, does that, does that, like, do you understand what he means by, like, by that? Like, God at any given time is doing thousands and thousands and thousands of things in and through your life. But our puny little minds are only consciously aware of like two or three of them. He's doing so much, and yet there's so little that we'll actually be aware of. And, and this is something that Jesus dealt with with his disciples. Time and time again, when we read about the, the ministry of Jesus in the New Testament, you see his disciples missing it. They're missing out on the bigger lesson. They're so focused on the miracle that they're not seeing what Jesus is trying to teach to them. And he almost has to like backtrack and be like, ah, you missed it. Okay, you missed, yeah, I know, like I did, I did this and it was awesome and you're, you're awestruck by that, but you missed the bigger picture. You missed what I was, the picture that I was trying to paint of my kingdom, of what God the Father is like. You're missing out on me. And again, this is coming back to the idea of, if in this series of vintage Jesus, it's turning our focus and our attention away from the work of his hands to his face, to who he is. We're familiar with the stories of Jesus' miracles, but do you know the Jesus of those miracles? We can recite the different stories of the miraculous things that he did when he walked on water. That was cool. When he fed the crowds, that was cool. When he healed the sick, that was cool. We know the stories. Do you know the man behind the stories? That's what it means to be turning our focus away from his hands to his face. And so tonight... I want to look at four different important encouragements that we need to consider uh, that we can know about how God provides and how he cares for you. You ready to dive into this? If you're a note taker, we'll have stuff on the screen for you too. The first one is this. God provides differently than we expect. God provides differently than we expect. In fact, most of the time, he provides differently than, than we expect. Because again, going back to uh, Philippians, he says he will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. But anytime we are asking for blessing or we are asking for provision, we are asking from the context of our glory and our opinion and our life experience. Uh, the, the church that I grew up in, we had the, the lead pastor just loved always opening up a sermon with like a joke. Um, and, you know, some of them were like hokey. Some of them were pretty cool. Some of them were like, I'm not sure you can say that from the stage. But he had, he had one that, that I heard no fewer than like five times from him. And you've probably heard it before, but it's a story of this man. He's on a boat. That's all the context I have for you. All right, so don't ask questions. He's on a boat in the ocean where boats go. And he falls overboard. And he becomes lost at sea, and the boat takes off, and he's simply there. He's just treading water, and he's crying out to God. He's saying, God, save me. God, I need something miraculous. I need you to save me. Please save me. And a short time later, there's actually a boat, a different boat, that comes alongside, and it comes right alongside him, and they try to cast him a line. And they say, grab the line. We'll pull you in. And he says, no, don't worry about it. God's going to save me. And they're like, what? This guy's crazy. And they take off. Again, don't ask questions, all right? I have no more context than that. And then a little while later, there's, there's a guy on a jet ski, all right? Because it's relatively close to shore. A guy on a jet ski comes along. He's like, hey, hop on. I'll take you back to, the sh back to shore. And the guy treading water is like, no, it's okay. I'm getting tired, but I prayed God is going to save me. And so the guy on the jet ski takes off because he's got jet ski things to do. And then a helicopter comes out. It's the Coast Guard. 
the Coast Guard comes out, and they've got, you know, the guy who, like, repels off the, you've seen the movies, he jumps out of the, out of the helicopter, and he's like, we're here to rescue you, we got the call, we're here to save you, and the guy pushes him away, and he says, no, I'm fine, God is going to save me, and so the helicopter leaves, and the man drowns, the end, no, I'm kidding, that's not the end, and he drowns, and, he, and, he's, and he's up in heaven, and, there's, and, and God is there, and he, and he greets him at, at the gates, because this is theologically sound, obviously. Uh, and God meets him at the gates. And the guy is, is peeved. He's, he's like pretty discouraged by this. He's like, God, I prayed for you to save me. I was out in the middle of the ocean. I was lost at sea. I prayed for you to save me, and you never came. And God's sitting there, and he's like, I sent you a boat. I sent you a jet ski. I sent you a helicopter. And the point of that, exactly, that's the exact reaction that any, any congregation would usually get when he would tell that joke. But what it does is, it's not so much for the humor side of it, but it's to give us kind of a silly representation of how we pray. When we pray for God's provision, we've already decided what that provision should look like. When we have prayed, when we pray for God's blessing in our life, we've decided what that blessing should look like. And so when provision comes along, according to God's will and according to his riches, we don't recognize it as provision because it's not what we wanted. It's not what we expected. He provides differently than we expect. Have you ever, have you ever asked, you know the fruits of the Spirit? You have love, you have joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, have you ever prayed for one of those fruits of like, if you know you're not a patient person, have you, anybody in here? Don't raise your hand. You don't have to. All right. I'm, I won't call you out like that. Have you ever prayed for patience? Have you ever just known, okay? Like when you first got that new job, it was really exciting, but now you're six months into it and it's Monday morning and you're like, oh, oh because there are just those people at your job. You know their names. Don't say them out loud. You know who they are, who just Take every ounce of patience that you have, and you're not patient to, to begin with. And so you just say that prayer. You're like, God, I need patience to get through this day. Please give me patience. And what happens is God doesn't equip you with super. He's like, you're super patient now. Da, da, da. Like, that's not what it is. You don't have, you might not be given supernatural patience, but you know what God will do? If you ask for patience, he will provide an opportunity to be patient. So you show up to that job, and guess who's there? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Weird time to chime in, but thank you. All right? And so you show up, and what do you have? You have an opportunity to be patient. If you ask God, man, I want to be living with more grace. I want to be more forgiving of people. He doesn't simply give you supernatural forgiveness or a supernatural gift of forgiveness. What he does is he reveals all the opportunities in your life that you have to be forgiving, to offer forgiveness. But so often we will ask God faithfully for something. We'll say, God, grant me this. And he's like, all right, here's an opportunity. And we're like, oh, not like that. No, not, that's not what I meant. That's not what I had in my head. That's not what I pictured when I was asking for this thing. He provides differently than we might expect. But kind of going along, along with the theme, a the second thing that we need to understand when it comes to provision is that the whole point is to seek the provider, not the provision. Again, going from the hands of Jesus to the face of Jesus. Don't focus simply on the provision. Focus on the provider. What does this look like? I love this. It says, many say that they have a love for God, but their love is only affection for God as the giver of good gifts and pleasant circumstances. This type of love is really a love of self because God is not the supreme object of the appreciation. It is merely a love for God as a provider. It is not a biblical love. If you love God because of the gifts that he gives, if you love God because of his provision, if you love provision more than you love the provider, you love Santa Claus. You don't love God. It's about the provider. It's not about the provision. It's not about the gifts. It's not about the blessing. Why? Because our greatest need is for more of God. And this is something that he gladly gives us. Oftentimes we think, God, I need more of this. If I could have more money, 
I, could, I would be satisfied. If I could have more security, I could be satisfied. If I could have more status, I would be satisfied. If I could have more approval, I would be satisfied. If I could have more followers on Instagram or people following my, like subscribing to my YouTube page, if I could have more of that, I would finally be satisfied. And we pray for that. But why would God want to bless the efforts that we are making to find satisfaction in anything outside of him? Why would God want us to be seeking satisfaction in things of this world when we are clearly not created for this world? We're created for him. God is creator. God is provider. But he provides for our greatest need, and your greatest need, despite what you may think, will always be for more of him. Not more things. Not more stuff not more security, not more status, not more approval, not more money, more of him. Our greatest need is for more of God, and it is something that he gladly gives us. God always provides more of himself. That's how he gives. That's how he provides. This week I was thinking about... Um, I was looking at, you know how sometimes you can open your, up your phone and it will show you like memories from years ago or like old pictures and stuff like that. Mine, my phone is just like all, it's all my two boys. I have a three-year-old and then a one and a half, one and a half year old at home. And there was a picture, it was one of the first pictures that I ever took of my first son, Rylan. Um, and he's, he was, you know, he's the boy who made me a father. And I just remember so clearly, so vividly that night. It wasn't even daytime. It was nighttime. I had no idea what time it was because we had been there so long, but we were in the hospital room and my wife, because she's a warrior, like freak, you know, like delivered this, this child into the world. And, and, you know, the doctors are there and the nurses are there and they, as, as soon as, as soon as he's delivered, like they take him and they kind of do like the different wellness checks to make sure he's breathing right and everything. They hold him up by the ankles and smack him in the butt, you know, to make sure, no, they don't do that anymore. Can you believe that used to be like a real thing that they used to do, though? Like, that was, that was a real thing. Like, back in the day, you know, you would deliver a baby, and they, they would want to make sure that, you know, you got to get the baby to cry to make sure that the lungs are functioning and there's nothing blocking the airways. And so, you know, the old-timey, I always picture it in, like, black and white, the old-timey uh, doctor, like, holding up, he's like, ah, it's a baby, see? Smack! You know, and then, <laughs> like, it starts crying. Thankfully, they don't do that anymore because I would have been throwing hands if anybody tried to smack my baby. Um, but they take the baby... And they kind of take it over here and they, and they clean them up and they're just making, like taking vitals and making sure everything's good and, and, and everything's look good. And, and, and he's calmed down at this point. And this whole time I'm just, I'm with Taylor, my wife, and I'm just making sure she's, she's good. And she's like, she's, oh my gosh. Like I witnessed a real life miracle that day. And it was like, I've never looked at my wife the same way. I've just like, you can do anything and everything. And I can do very little. My contribution to the whole process of that was minimal. Okay. And she did everything and it was amazing. And they, they bring, they bring Ryland back and they give, they give him to her and, and they're just laying there and, and she feeds him. And then she, she needs to get some rest and the nurses come back and they're checking, checking on Ryland again. And it's been, at this point, it's maybe been like two hours or something. And I haven't even held him yet. And the nurse, right before she leaves, she just says, like, do you want to hold your son? And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> and so she comes over and she hands me this bundle. And he's asleep. And then she, she's just like, I'll leave you guys alone, uh, you know, alone for a little while so mom can, can sleep. And she leaves and she turns the light off and she closes the, the door behind her of this hospital room, this delivery room that we're in. And I look down at this face and I remember just sinking because I was overwhelmed in that moment with a love for this child that I couldn't understand, that I couldn't comprehend. I had so much, like in that moment, I was like, I will take on the forces of evil across this entire world for you, and I just met you. And I had this love that I couldn't comprehend, that I couldn't understand, and I held him close, and I wept. I sat on the floor of this delivery room, and I just wept. 
holding my son for the very first time because of this love that was overwhelming and pouring out of me. And it was a love for this baby, not because of anything that he could do for me, not because of any intrinsic value that he was adding to my life. Like he didn't come out and he's like, time to get a job so I can pay rent. Like there was no, there was no value. There was nothing that he could offer me. There were no accolades. There were no prizes. He wasn't graduating first in his class of like one hour year olds, you know, or one hour olds. That's not how it worked. This love wasn't coming from a place of, I love you because of everything that you can do for me. I love you because of the value, the intrinsic value that you have. I was overwhelmed in that moment with the love that I had for this child simply because he was mine. That baby that I was holding in my arms for the first time that I felt overwhelming love for. I loved him simply because he was mine. And it was a love that I had never felt that I could never experience ever. And in that moment, I was like, you can ask me for anything and I'll give you anything. But as a good father, as he's growing up, he's three years, he's three years old now. My son asks me for a lot. He asks me for a lot of things. And I say, no a lot. There's a lot of things that he asks for that I have to say no to because being a loving father doesn't mean ask anything and I will give you anything. He's like, fine, can I have Jolly Ranchers for breakfast? And I'm like, again, that's the third day this week. No, I'm not going to give him the things that he wants simply because he wants them. And yet there's a trust that we have developed in the time that we have spent together because he knows that I love him. He knows that I want what is best for him. There's a lot of things that he'll ask me for throughout the day that I have to say no to. But the one thing that I will never say no to is when he asks for just more of me. When he just wants my time. He'll ask, he's got a sweet tooth. So he'll ask for this and that and the other. And I'm like, dude, that's going to make you really sick. You can't do that. He'll ask to do things that are kind of dangerous. And I have to say, no, you can't do that. But I can be in the middle of working, in the middle of a phone call. And sometimes he'll just come into the living room and he'll just sit on the couch and he'll say, daddy, can you sit with me? And he knows that I will never say no to that. I will never say no to my son when he's just asking for more of me. Because of the love that I have for him, I have a desire to only give him and always give him more of myself. And if I feel that towards my son as his earthly father, how much more does your heavenly father desire to give you more of himself? You ask for more money, you ask for more status. You ask for more success. You ask for more worldly possessions. You ask for more material things. You ask for more of the things that, that, that look good to you in this world. And a lot of times the answer is going to be no. When's the last time you just asked for more of him? When is the last time you just, God, I just want to sit with you. I want to see your face. I want to know you more. Again, turning our attention away from the hands to the face. Scripture tells us to make the pursuit of God the primary function of our lives. And this is unequivocal, and you can't argue this. The primary function of your life is the pursuit of God. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, it says, But seek first, first and foremost, before anything else, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And then in Psalm 37, verse 4, one of the books of wisdom, it says, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Take delight in in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. But when we talk about the desires of your heart, the important distinguishing factor is the desires of your heart will follow after what you delight in. So if you delight in things of this world, there it is. If you delight in things of this world, the desires of your heart are always going to pull you towards things of this world. If you take delight in finances, 
in success, in status, in anything that this world has to offer, then your heart will desire. The desires of your heart are gonna point you in that direction. But he says, seek first the kingdom. He says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. When we take delight in the Lord, all we want is more of him and he will give you, he will grant you, he will provide for you the desires of your heart. A lot of times we get discouraged and turn, turned away from the idea of Christianity because it's just a list of rules and it's a list of all the things that I have to deny myself. All the pleasantries and joys and pleasures of this world, I have to say no to them to prove my commitment to this. We've become convinced of the lie that Christianity is all about denying the desires of our heart. I couldn't be further from the truth. God wants to give you. God wants to provide for you the desires of your heart. But before he does that, he wants to change the desires of your heart. Because right now, the desires of your heart are chasing after the things that you delight in. And for as long as you delight in anything outside of Christ, as long as you delight in anything outside of the creator and the provider, that is what your heart will delight in. That is what your, your heart will desire. So here's a question I want to pose for you. What is the deepest root of your joy? What is the deepest root of your joy? Is it what God gives to you? Or is it what God is to you? Your deepest joy, your deepest satisfaction, your contentment, your hope in life, is it based on what God gives to you or doesn't give to you? Or is it based on what God is to you? Because if, you, if we establish our greatest joy in life in what God does or doesn't do for our lives, we're going to be like 50-50 at best. Why? Because our opinion is always going to be changing of, hey, God is only good when he gives me what I ask him for. God is only good when he provides in the ways that I expect him to. If that's what we're basing our joy in, then your joy, your, your status, your, your template of joy, the standard for joy is always going to be changing. But if we are rooting our joy in what God is, in who he is, that is unchanging and it remains the same. So you have a choice are you rooting your deepest joy in what God gives you or in what God is to you? Because God graciously guides us into a greater realization that our ultimate need is for more of his word and more of his ways and for more of him. God always provides more of himself because that is our greatest need and that is the greatest thing that he can provide for us. He always provides more of himself. Thirdly, God's ultimate provision has already been given in the gospel. Have you heard of it? The good news. God's greatest provision has already been given in the gospel. We ask God for plenty of things on a daily basis, but the greatest thing that we could ever receive from him has already been, been given to us. The greatest thing we could possibly receive from him has already been given. John MacArthur puts it this way. He says, as Christians, we find complete sufficiency in Christ and his provisions for our needs. There's no such thing as an incomplete or deficient Christian. Our Savior's divine power has granted, us, has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Human wisdom offers nothing to augment that. Every Christian receives all he or she needs at the moment of salvation. Each one must grow and mature, but no necessary resource is missing. At the moment of salvation, you are lacking in nothing. And nothing can be added to augment that. There's no need to search for something more. Because the ultimate good he provided us through whom much of the other good things come to us, is Jesus. What is the point? What is the truth that the gospel message is driving forward? Jesus is the ultimate treasure. Jesus is the ultimate provision. He is the provision. 
God always wants to provide more of himself. And so Jesus, what he said is, is, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you want more of the Father, it comes through Jesus. Because through his entire ministry and the gospel message, the gospel that is presented to you, the the offer of salvation that is offered to you is not asking the question as to whether or not you want to spend eternity in heaven or eternity in hell. The, The question that is asked over and over and over again throughout the history of the Old Testament and Jesus's ministry and the gospels of the New Testament is, do you want God? Not, hey, do you want to go to heaven? It's, do you want God? Do you want more of him? Because from the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, we read the story of how God created. We have the creation account. And it took three chapters for us to screw that up. You have Adam and Eve in the garden, and they eat of the one tree that they were instructed not to eat from. And we're like, God, why'd you put that tree in the garden in the first place then? Could have saved us all a lot of trouble. The reason was is because God wanted them to experience love and relationship with him, but you cannot have love without the choice and the option to reject. So he put them in the garden, and they give him a choice to love or to reject, to love him or to love themselves, to put him first or to put themselves first. And in chapter 3, they decide that they're the ones who are worthy of worship and honor and praise. And it ruins everything. And we become separated from the presence of God because what is imperfect cannot be in the same space as what is perfect. And God's promise is echoed all throughout thousands of years of human history after that point. He says, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to provide a way because there is nothing that you can do to reconcile yourselves back to perfection because there is a standard for salvation and the standard is perfection. And Paul tells us all fall short. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the unfortunate fact of the matter is the wage of that sin is death. Death always involves separation of some kind. And so in chapter three of Genesis, we see not just the beginning of sin, but we also see shame And we see death through separation from his presence. There's a problem of sin and it's a problem that needs to be dealt with in some way, but it's not a problem that we can deal with. There's no amount of effort. There's no amount of forgiveness of our own sins. There's nothing we can do. So he provides a way. And his greatest provision has already been offered to you. And there is nothing that can augment that. There is nothing that can be added to that. God's greatest provision through his son Jesus was the gift and the provision of salvation that would forever fix the issue of sin so that death would no longer have the final say in your life. The ultimate good he provided us through whom much of the other good things come to us is Jesus Jesus is the ultimate provision. So the next time you're taking a moment to pray and say, God, I need more money. He's like, nah, you need Jesus. (laughs) Before we start to address the things that you want, we need to address the things that you need. And your greatest need will never be more money. Some of you in here are like, have you seen gas prices and rent prices lately? I've seen them. Your greatest need will never be anything of this world. Your greatest need will always be more of him. Not more money, not more things. Solomon understood this well. In Ecclesiastes, he takes the idea of, essentially he takes the idea of of what would life look like without God? What would existence look like without God? And the first three chapters of Ecclesiastes, these books of wisdom, he's, he's taking this idea that we've romanticized We've romanticized the idea of like, ah, God and church, that's a lot of rules. It's a lot of things that I need to deny myself. No thanks. I think I'm going to go and I'm going to live life the way that I want to. 
I'm going to live as if there is no God because I want nothing to do with him. And so Solomon, in all of his wisdom, said, all right, let's play that scenario out. Let's play the scenario out to its logical end and let's see where it gets us. And he, the man who had everything at that time, all the riches, all the glory, all the fame, all the power, all the authority, all the wisdom, he said, if you try, he's trying to wrap his brain around what that would look like to try and remove God from that equation. He has this, he came with this Hebrew word, hevel. It's nothingness. It's vanity. It's meaningless. It's a vapor. It's like you blow a bubble and then you pop it. What are you left with? <laughs> hevel. It's meaningless. He plays that out to its logical end. You don't think you need God in your life? Let's see what that actually looks like. All the wisdom that the world has to offer, all the things the world has to offer, everything you could possibly want in this world, you have it all, and what are you left with at the end of your life? Nothing. It's all meaningless. Jesus is your ultimate treasure. And sometimes we have a hard time seeing that because we've become distracted by everything else in this life. We go through this life building up treasures for ourselves in this world. And many of us Christians in the church, we're afraid of death. Why? Because every day in this world is a day closer to death which means it's every, every day is one day closer to losing the treasures that we've been storing up in this life. The treasures that have given us some sense of security, some sense of hope, some sense of truth, something to hold on to. But maybe the issue you're running into is you're having a hard time seeing the need that you have of God's greatest provision of more of him through his son, Jesus. Because until Jesus is all that you have, you won't truly recognize that he is all that you need. God wants to provide for your greatest need first and foremost. And your greatest need will always, despite your circumstances, despite whatever you might think, despite what your experience has been, your greatest need will always be more of Him. And as a gracious and good and forgiving and loving Heavenly Father, all He wants to give you is more of Himself. And that's an incredible thing to realize. And as the band comes up, I want to leave you with a final thought. When it comes to God's provision, and we've been looking at these great ways, we've been, we, well, I think they're okay. When you look at God, how God provides differently than we expect, it's about seeking the provider and not the provision. It's about his ultimate provision that has already been given through the gospel. Here's the one last thing that I want to leave you with. You might be a part of God's miraculous provision. Have you ever considered that you could be a part of God's provision in someone else's life. As members of the church, as bodies of the church, those of you who are in Christ, have you ever considered that God could use you, yes, even someone like you, to be the provision in someone else's life? Never underestimate the power of one word of encouragement in somebody's life. Never underestimate the power of one interaction in someone's life. All it might take is one word of encouragement. All it might take is one text encouraging someone. All it might take is you spending a little bit of time with someone to provide to them exactly what they needed in that moment. Because God provides for our greatest needs, but it doesn't always look the way that we expect. And there are people in this room right now who are just praying, God, I want to feel seen. I want to feel valued. I need encouragement. I need patience. I need grace. I need, I just need some love today. And you know what God might send them? You. You could be the provision in someone else's life. 
that's an incredible opportunity. That's an incredible calling. That's an incredible chance that you have to have real and lasting impact. Jesus is the greatest provision that has ever been provided for us, but God continues to work in miraculous ways, even through someone like you. Even through someone like you. 2 Corinthians 9, 11. It says, you will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Faith is trusting God to do what he has promised because we are convinced by his provisions that God is both willing and able to keep his word. And God, that's our prayer tonight, is that we come back to that truth and that understanding that real faith is marked by trusting you to do what you have promised because we are convinced by your provision that you are both willing and able to keep your word. You keep your promises. You are faithful even when we're not. You are good, you are faithful, and you bless and you provide even when we are ignoring and when we're not paying attention. But God, we thank, we thank you for your greatest provision that you have ever given to us. And that was salvation, that was reconciliation. We were bought back and adopted into your family at the ultimate cost of Christ on the cross. We thank you for that. And we wanna continue living with the perspective of the provision that we have already been provided. It's in your name we pray tonight, amen.